Viewers like you make this program possible. Support your local PBS station. That's the flyest chef jacket I've ever seen. <laughs> ever, ever, yeah. ever. Yeah. You shut it down. Houston, where West Africa meets America. I'm trying to pass a message mm -hmm. with the food. Don't forget where you come from. Mm -hmm. Now it's cool to be African. There's this big Wakanda movement. Mm -hmm. Where was Wakanda when I grew up in Sweden, by the way? Right. Where was that? Where was that? You know, I've lived in different parts of the world, and I always have to go out of my way to get the foods that I grew up on. The beauty about West African cuisine is it's not subtle. Nigerians love spicy food. Yeah. Suya spice, which you'll see on the streets of West Africa. Suya, yeah, suya, suya, suya everything. Ooh. Jalof rice. Yes. This, for me, is my favorite dish. It's like the best of Houston. It might be unfamiliar to you, but this is the foundation of soul food. Tell me about the suya Hennessy chicken, because <laughs> those are like some of the best things in life. And food gives us these reference points that can actually start a new dialogue, build a new bridge, reclaim, yeah. and yeah. own yeah. being Nigerian in America. Definitely. It's about contemporary renditions of West African cuisine and just trying to make it our own. This dish, I really feel African. That's what we're shooting for. This is flavor <laughs> yeah. that we've been waiting for, oh, like yeah. legit. The truth is going to come out. This is good. This is us. We have arrived. Yeah. We, we have arrived. arrived. And this is the perfect example of telling incredible food stories. I'm Chef Marcus Samuelson, and as an immigrant born in Ethiopia and raised in Sweden, food to me has always told a deeper, more personal story. It's a path to culture, identity, and history. Join me on a new journey across the country to learn more about America's immigrant communities and culinary traditions to see how food connects us all. Houston. Oil City in Texas. It's wide, it's big. We know that amazing music comes from Houston, right? From jazz to hip hop to, of course, Solange and Bees from Houston. It's also the number one most diverse city in the country. And that has huge impact on its food. There is big Vietnamese community, Indian, Mexican, barbecue, Middle Eastern, but also West African. You have some Senegalese, some Ghana, even Liberia, but it's heavily dominated by the Nigerian community. So Nigeria is the most populated country in Africa. It was colonized by the British until 1960. And after it gained independence, there were tribal and political conflicts that led to one of the bloodiest civil wars in Africa. In the 1980s, you had years of economic turbulence. And you start to see the first big wave of Nigerians leaving for America. The Nigerian community in Houston grew to become one of the largest communities outside Nigeria. But its food has yet to hit the mainstream. Wow, this is nice. Yes, huh? yes, what's over here? Beautiful. Yeah. I see the scotch bonnet. I see my habanero. You know how Nigerians love spicy food. Yeah. The red ones are usually the mild one. It's okay. the orange that we the use. The orange that gets you. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle Kavachi is a Nigerian-American chef. She also found the art of fufu, which mission is really to educate about West African cuisine. Ooh. This stuff, when you go to a West African market, this is what takes over the smell of the whole market. Yes, I mean, that flavor that gives us that uniqueness is our preserved fish. And yeah. stuck fish and smoked fish is a huge part of our cooking. This right? is what people can tell you, like, whoa. Yeah. We have arrived. We have, <laughs> we have arrived. So this is what smells, right? Yes. I love it, though. So this is why it's in the freezer. One of the number one appetizer for Nigerians is goat head. They put it in a nice room, and they cut this up. And I kid you not, it's delicious. And I always tell people, don't knock it till you try it. Yes. 
The beauty about West African cuisine is that it hasn't really been touched. It's still very authentic. It's not subtle. It's big. It's broad. It's smelly. Just all these strong fragrances and flavors are in your face. But if you start to understand them, they're incredibly delicious. The other ingredients here I'm pretty familiar with. Here's where I want to get lost. Mm -hmm. And as a chef, that's always exciting to when you can learn things. something, right? Mm -hmm. So this is mostly for stews and soups. This is the draw soups one of the go-tos in a lot of Nigerian cooking. What do you mean with draw? You know how okra has that? Oh, so the slime from the okra is really the texture of that, Yes, right? so this obono is soup that we call a draw, draw soup. soup. It goes A little up. thicker, like mm -hmm. cool. I did not know that soup was such a big part of Nigerian cooking. Of course. The soups all come with the tribe. Mm -hmm. That's how they know where so you're the from. The Fulani would have one soup, yes. and the Igbo would have one. But have you ever had peanut soup? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But that, for the record, that is from Ghana, so do not take that. No, 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 that no, no. That is no. not from no, Nigeria, no, no. that is from Ghana. No, no. I just want to make that very clear. <laughs> Tribal food is something as Americans we think we're not familiar with, but it's no different than regional cuisine of, let's say, Texas. From New England, you have Southern food, you have Creole, which you have learned to appreciate and understand, right? This is the same concept. We're hungry because we're talking about Nigerian food. What is Nigerian food? Hmm. Right? Before talking to you about it, we'd like to taste it. Yes. Yeah. Please come with me. Thank you. Smack my kitchen. I love it. So oh, first, yeah. I want to show you. This is our authentic Nigerian jollof rice. Jollof rice. I'm telling you, it doesn't get any better than this. Mm, that's oh, a big part. Th it is. Jollof rice, it's almost like noodles in Southeast Asia. You find a version of it all over West Africa. The key ingredient is rice, tomatoes, onions, and peppers. Jollof rice, when I taste this, this is like the base for so many rice, right? Yes. Jambalaya you find, obviously, in New Orleans and all throughout the bayou. Also, Spanish paella, very similar, right? The jollof rice is the rice that every variation from, from West Africa, from the Caribbean, from all over, like, you could tell that it's migrated in different regions different with regions. its own twist. Yeah, it's delicious. Still looks good, man. How does this, honestly, how does this make you feel, though? This is, this is really a sense of arrival, right? Just the idea of being at Azobia is just <sighs> means so much to me mm -hmm. because I can truly remember when I was small and to feel like we were different. Yeah. You, your clothing was different, your culture was different. Everything you kind of never fit it in, so right? so different for us. Mm -hmm. And I remember when it was International Day yeah. at school, when my teacher said that this is everyone's opportunity to bring a dish from mm -hmm. your country. What did you bring? My mom actually made stew with white rice. I was so happy. I was like, finally, you understand where yeah. I'm from. You understand my food. You understand everything about me. My teacher gave me back my dish and told me, tell your mom thank you, but we didn't know what it was. What? So they didn't, they didn't give it out to the kids? No. And I and the little third grade me was like, but you never asked me yeah. what it was. Yeah. But this was back in the 90s, yeah. you know? So we were just that little small international aisle. Yeah. Now we're with Zobia. You're here. This is us. We have arrived. Yes. We yeah. have arrived. So when you are in Africa, most Africans think of themselves as black, but it's not something that you are conscious of as a daily reality. But when you get here and you come into a culture where there is black and white divisions, there is a kind of mental disorientation that follows that. And so in that kind of situation, you want to control your realities, you want to deflect the indignities of racism, and you also want to assert yourself. Like Nigerians, for instance, are very proud people. And what they did was to form a very strong and tight community because that's how we protect ourselves. They started creating a Nigerian universe within the Houston community. Chef Kivachi, she's a force. And I know where she got it from because she's about to introduce me to her mother, Safari. Safari is really ground zero for the Nigerian community in Houston. 
That's in the heart of Bissonette Street in the Southwest. She started this business 30 years ago by selling Nigerian food out of a car, MC Hammer style. The minute you enter, you open that door to Safari, you're no longer in Houston, you're in Lagos. I love this first How big was the Nigerian community before you opened? Then it was not much. Mm. Right now, it's very, very big. But this but was one of the... But the 80s, few. So this was one of the first Nigerian restaurants in Houston, right? Yes, sir. So you grew up here? Yes, I grew up in this kitchen. You grew up in this. So you done every position. You counted yes. the cash. Yes. You done dishes. Yes. Was she any good in the kitchen? Or was Everybody she... contributed. You yes. have a lot of kids. Everybody's doing one Everybody. thing or the other. So you have a lot of kids. That means that you have a lot of staff. Yes. <laughs> free, free. I want to see. I want to see the kitchen. Okay, I come on. Welcome to our kitchen. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Safari is a tribe leader, right here in Houston. And what tribe are you? We're the Ibos from the eastern Ibos. part. Ibos. And you are also a tribe leader here. There's not a lot of women that are chiefs. Well, mine is by merit. I yeah. didn't pay for it. So no, I. I'm triple <laughs> no. chief. She's somebody that kept all this African tradition with them. Today, she's teaching me how to make traditional fufu. You know, in Ethiopia, we don't eat fufu. It's all the injera bread. But fufu is to Nigerians what injera bread is to Ethiopians, right? And what is fufu? Fufu is made out of yam. Oh, this is big. I import it yeah. from Nigeria. So we're going to peel it. After that, we'll boil it. Mm. OK, step one in the fufu class. Yes. Yes. Are you ready? You know, see if this little Ethiopian boy can hang with the Nigerians. Are your arms feeling a little bit tired now? No, no, I'm good. Oh, wow. You have no faith in the brothers. <laughs> no. The sound of safari pounding fufu is very familiar to me. You find it all over Africa, pounding either corn, sometimes spices. It's almost like a drum beat. So I'm watching safari making this soft fufu. But I realize why she has to make it so smooth. Because there's something called swallow in Nigerian tradition that kind of defines are you in? Do you understand the culture? Do you respect the culture? So the fufu comes wrapped in a plastic surround wrap. Right next to that, you get a stew that is okra, goat, whole fish, bones, and everything. I love the sliminess of this texture, right? Yes. Wow. Perfect. Perfect, right? You pick up your fufu, a little bit bigger than a ping pong ball, and then you scoop up the stew and you swallow. Again, cannot chew it, and of course I'm chewing it, because there's big bones in the stew. That swallow. Did you swallow? <laughs> what do you think, Safari, for the future? What do you hope for the Nigerian community? You built it. You now created this platform for the kids. The most essential thing about the whole thing, our kids are interested so much about African things. They are taking it into a different level. Mm. Like me, I'm getting old, I'm tired, but my daughter now, her friends, they're into everything. Whatever they are doing, they're doing it better than we. Mm. We were just money, money, we want money, 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 but they want to take it to a different level. Yes. They want to build a rock, like a name, that they will stand upon, you understand me? Nice. So I'm so happy. But isn't it amazing that your mom was actually part of building that community? You walking in, to like a, a set table. Yes. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Pressure. I won't say pressure because when you've seen so much through her, through my mom's eyes, and seeing the community grow, back then it was hard for us yeah. because we didn't really know ourselves within this American culture. But now it's like, no, we are the culture. Beautiful. Now I see why you've been so successful over the last 30 years. You really created a place for the community. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Chef Michel is going to take me to one of the most iconic dishes in Nigerian cuisine, suja. 
It is kind of this chicken skewer or beef skewer with this incredible peanut sauce that has a little bit of heat. So it's Auntie Patricia that is the boss and Ahmad that is a childhood friend to Michelle Kevachi. So, Auntie, tell me about suya. Where does suya come from in Nigeria? Uh, originally from the northern Nigeria. A lot of Nigeria is a Christian country, mm -hmm. but the northern part is Muslim. That's where Abuja is, the capital, and now in the Hausa region, the Hausa tribe, and that's where suya comes from. Mm -hmm. And who taught you how to make suya? Nobody taught me in the north. Any cooking does by women, but when it comes to the suya, the suya is does by men. Oh, wow. Yes. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. What is the spice rub that you put on top of suya? Uh -huh. Everybody has their own secret, and the major thing is the kuli kuli, as I told you. What is kuli kuli? Uh, I don't know how to explain it in English, but that is the... That uh, is the secret. <laughs> I love it. She acts like, I don't know. Uh, she's very smart. Yes, sir. <laughs> Here, this is what I'm talking about. Here is the secret sauce. Here it is. Where are you going? <laughs> so now you... What, 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 what do we have in here? That is, uh, I, I can't explain it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so you, you just take this and... Yes. Uh, uh -huh, the name is Red Pen. That yeah, is, uh, we're going to call it Red yes, Pen. Yes, we call it Red Pen. Nice. <laughs> so, it smells too good to be yeah. Red Pen. No. <laughs> and then we put it on the grill? Yeah, you put it on the grill and nice. when it's ready... Nice, it smells good. Yeah. Like all African countries, Nigeria has many different tribes with many different opinions. Yes. But a dish like suya brings all Nigerians together. This is the, yeah. the, the general food that combines the country together, suya. Yeah. Everybody eats the yeah. suya. And you see your boys. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm with them every day. Nice. Mm. Nice. This looks great. I'm going to try a chicken one. So what is the tomato and onion for here? The tomato and the onions to take away the spice, because, you know, some people don't eat spicy food. Yeah. So, like, mine is mild here. So, okay. I'm a, my mother doesn't eat <laughs> spicy food. Yes. So, yeah. the chicken mean? is mild. He's not Nigerian? No, he is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? So, so good. So, did you grow up here, or you grew up in Nigeria? No, I was born in Nigeria, mm. and then I uh, came here when I was about 14. And what about you? I was 18. 18? Uh-huh. How can it be? He's 18, you were 16. You kept your pidgin English, but he's like got the southern English going on. What, what was it? Yeah. Because when I was a kid, I watched a lot of cartoons. I was <laughs> repping for America. <laughs> you were repping at home? Yeah, so I came. No, pidgin is something you got to hold on to. Yeah. That is his own uh, thing. Oh, I mean, yeah. I love that. I don't want to, I don't want to lose my, No, my people. Yeah. It was introduced in America by Akeem Olajuwon. Oh. And we're keeping it. You can't be in Houston and don't bring up Akeem Olajuwon, one of the first mainstream athletes that broke from Africa into American culture. He didn't shy away from being African. He didn't shy away from being a Muslim. He really is like, I'm going to own this, and I'm going to bring people with me on this journey. Yes, and Olajuwon, he changed, like, African culture. Yes, like. in what way? Because he was proud of being yeah. Nigerian. He motivated more people to even come to move to Houston, yes, yes. yes. That's why they gave him a statue. You know, there's obviously African-American, and then there's people like us that are African and American. Mm -hmm. yes. That tiny little and can be beautiful because that's a culture window into differences. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's gifts on it's both ends. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know what I understand? This is the best suya in, in uh, Houston. Thank you. This is so yes. good, and I made yes, a mess. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank it was you fantastic. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And thank you I'll for showing it. us. Oh, yeah. And I got to say, that's the flyest chef jacket I've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> Ever, ever, ever. Yeah. You shut it down. My Ooh. mama's the chef, I'm the grill master. Yeah, yeah, but that's the flying grill jacket ever. Just like that. We are James and Jolly Honorable, the owners of Jolly Jolly Bakery, right here in Houston, Texas. We are both from Nigeria, came to Houston in 1981. We've been in this location eight years. Nigeria is a big bread culture. Yes. Culture, yeah. We can eat it with beans. Stew. Stew. Bread and stew. Coke. Bread and coke and peanuts. And That's peanuts. a popular way of eating it. <laughs> yes. They got some good bread in Nigeria, but not on the level of Jolly Jolly. 
you're looking for the softness, kind of like your pillow you lay on. Feel that? Mm. When we started thinking about this bakery, I was looking for a name. And I said, my wife's name is Jolly. Jolly means happiness. So that's how it came about. Just double Jolly. Yeah. <laughs> Our main business here is really bread, but we make other stuff also, such as scotch egg. Big British influence. If you remember, England or Britain are colonial masters. So we took the scotch egg. The scotch egg, yeah. We definitely took the tea, and we also took the Guinness beer. And Nigerians drink the most Guinness in the world. By customer base, you have Cameroonians, you have Nigerians, you have uh, Ghanaians. You have people from South Africa, Botswana, yeah. I mean, yeah. Kenya. Everywhere. They all come out here. Mm -hmm. Americans, Americans come out here for Jolly Jolly Bread. Yeah. The bread is our bread and butter. I have three wonderful sons. I would love for them to be a part of Jolly Jolly. My father left me nothing. I want to leave them with something. <laughs> this is for them. Really. This is for them, yeah. yeah. Marcus. Hello, sir. Hello. Nice to meet you, sir. Oye. Yes. Hi. So Oye and Tiffany is this amazing couple. They started their restaurant in Southwest Houston about three years ago, called Abuja. Now, their second venture is called Taste of Nigeria. It's not in the traditional Southwest part of Houston, where most of the West African community is. It's actually in the Galleria part of town, which kind of opened the door for a whole other audience. The other interesting thing is kind of wider than Taste of Nigeria, because they have cooks from Togo, Cameroon, Angola, Senegal. It's really aspirational to bring all of West Africa together. You guys are from Senegal, right? Yes, sir. Oh, what, Fulani or what? I'm Wala. We both Wala. Wala. Wala, stop. That's where the jollof Jeff rice come from. from. All over West Africa, people have rivalries. Where is the best jollof rice from? Nigerians are claiming it. People from Ivory Coast, people from Ghana. But it starts from the Wolof people from Senegal. These Senegalese sisters, they're gonna show me a dish that is so important. It's called chepo jam. Chep is fish, jam is rice. So, but we're gonna do another iconic Senegalese dish, actually, yeah. called chepo jam. Chepo jam. Chepo jam. Bohong. Bohong? Bohong. Bohong? Bo red. Red chepo jam. Red chepo jam. Yes. Okay, let's do it. Can I add in the scotch bonnet here? Scotch bonnet. And they don't play. The yellow is the strongest, and we're putting four in, so you know. Adomo has all the skills to be an amazing chef. And you know what? She's gonna let you know when you're wrong. Taro, mm -hmm. onion. No, 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 no onion, no onion. I'm taking the onion out. Okay. okay. If you drop the onion too early, take it out. Yes. If you are chopping in the wrong way, she will let you know. Right? We add this one. And now we're adding the cabbage. Uh, no, 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 not yet. Should we marinate the fish now? No, 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 no. She's no joke. No. No joke. And that's what I love about cooking, right? This is her dish. It matters. It should matter. If I come in there and mess it up, she's going to hold me accountable. I love Adomo. We know the great Nigerian restaurants. What about Senegalese? There is no Senegalese restaurant. We used to have one, but it yeah. closed. So this might be the goal, one day to have Senegalese restaurant. Yes. I know who's going to be the chef of the Senegalese restaurant. <laughs> the boss over oh, here. Thank you. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. Nice. Yes. Thank you. This is the famous Chepo Jan. It looks amazing. It smells so good. It's nice to see Senegal and Nigeria working together. That's nice. That's good. All African. All yes, African. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so yes. much. Bon appétit. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah, it tastes really good. good. I've had Chepo Jan in Dakar. Mm -hmm. This tastes even better. Wow. Mm. It is taste of Nigeria, but it's really 
taste of West Africa, right? When did the decision-making come in to, like, say, what about Senegal, what about Cameroon? How did that come about? We wanted to include other communities mm -hmm. that were not being properly represented because a lot of them are smaller, so they may not have a need to open up a restaurant. So because the Nigerian community is so big, they can feel, you know, like, hey, we're part of this, yeah. this growth. Yeah. And also, we have a lot of second-generation Nigerians yeah. born and bred here in America that grew up with the food, yeah. but they're professionals, nurses and doctors and sure. lawyers. They want to have it in an American standard way. Mm -hmm. mm. This yeah. is our pepper soup. That's Ooh. the catfish pepper catfish soup. Catfish pepper soup. We serve like the whole it. fish. And then that's goat meat pepper soup. Goat pepper yes. soup. Woo! <laughs> wow, the pepper soup is amazing. Yes, it's very Because it has this umami flavor, this fish flavor. Yes. yes. You're mixing sort of leaves. fish stock yes. and Yes. Meat stock, right? That's right. Yes. So you're tasting both, and that is mm -hmm. yes. such a killer broth. Yes. Thank you. It almost reminds me almost like a Japanese ramen in a way, right? It's yeah. very yes. much on a different tip, you yes. know? Yeah. But once I learn how to appreciate it, it's fantastic, exactly. right? That's right. right. People who enter the Southwest, they know I'm now entering the Nigerian community yes. and right. so yeah. on, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Being in this part of town gives access to a whole other demographic, exactly. right? Yes. Exactly. Now, with this new location, we're also pulling in people that are not Nigerian, that yes. are curious about the cuisine, uh, that may have never gone to Africa, yeah. but we can bring Africa to them in an yes. authentic way. You're African-American. Yes. And do you know where your ancestors are from? Me? Not really, but, Well, you chances know, are from Ghana, Nigeria. Yeah. somewhere on the West Coast, possibly, yeah. yeah. And we've had people come to the restaurant mm -hmm. that had taken the tests, the yeah. DNA tests, and found out, hey, I'm Igbo, mm -hmm. or I'm a large percentage Yoruba. What kind of food do they eat? Yeah. So that was really food. exciting yeah, to us. We were excited about that because we wanted to educate them on the food. Well, you guys should be really proud. You're putting the flag up, and you are bringing both communities mm -hmm. together, the American side and the African oh, yes. side. So yes. Congrats to them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. What's fascinating when you start looking under the hood of West African food, it might be unfamiliar to you. But this is the foundation of Southern food, soul food, the cuisine that we love in America, right? It's all here, it's all started in West Africa and came to America through slave trade. When we think about slavery in America, predominantly slaves came from West Africa. So West African brought their foodways and tradition across the Atlantic, and then infusing that with things that were growing here, with scraps, leftover. They really had to become innovators, and that's where your jollof becomes jambalaya, okra, fufu eventually becomes grits. So many of these traditions that we love really started there. Here's the real farmer. The sage looks great. And then here we have Swiss chard. Yeah. Regular kale that everybody sees in the grocery stores. Yeah. This is the uh, spiral mint. Good. Just rub it, and then you smell your hands, OK? We have broccoli over here. So Arisa and her mother, Elizabeth, they were farmers back in Liberia. Oh, like that was more. my finger. <laughs> that was my finger. Liberia has this very unique history among all African countries. It was created and established by former African-American slaves that resettled into Liberia in the 19th century and then started to build the nation. So you see things like collars, okra, you see things that you constantly see in America and South back to Liberia. It's almost like a tennis match going back and forth between food and culture. I love the fact that you have collard greens, like, so it's like culturally referenced. And did you grow collard greens in, back in Liberia as well? Yes. Nice. And we do cook a lot of okra, too. Yeah. You know, in Nigerian food, it's all about bitter greens and all of those things. Is Liberia also a lot of soups and greens? Yeah, a lot of greens here in Liberia. Because mm. since we eat a lot of rice, it's yeah. come with greens, cassava leaves. To the greens. Elizabeth, Arisa is picking all the big ones. She's not playing fair. <laughs> what was your favorite dish from your mom? Uh, plow wasa. What? 
flour soft. This is uh, leaves that when you cook it, it's slippery like okra. Oh. But it's not, it's vegetables. I cook some. Yeah? And I have it here. Here? Yeah. Can I taste? Sure. <laughs> oh, nice. I love it. I love when I can taste something I've never tried before. <laughs> So you brought this yourself? Yeah. Yeah, it does have that okra. Okay. Somewhere between spinach and okra. Mm-hmm. This is very good. Yeah, thanks. I've never had this green before. You know, like, you think about soul food and Liberian food, West African is very similar. Well, I love your lunch. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. The farm is nice. It's really, really good. Thank you. So Aretha and Elizabeth, they sell their produce in the local market space, both to people who love to go to the farmer's market, but also to chefs at the Houston restaurant scene. My name is Chef Jonathan Rhodes. We're in Northeast Houston right now, which is the location for a restaurant Indigo, where we focus on the history of soul food. If you're gonna have soul food authentically, you have to have it from an authentic area because soul food isn't made from rich ingredients. It's made from leftovers and things that are kind of passed down or overlooked. There's definitely West African in everything that we do. One was derived from the other. African Americans are the innovative version of the traditional West African. All these different West African foods carry the same spices, flavors, and ingredients as African Americans. So we just want to be able to showcase that history and that story. So you're from this area? You grew up here? Yeah, I grew up less than half a mile away from here. Every back street, every turn, yeah. uh, I know it all since I was a small child. When did you decide you wanted to become a chef? When I realized that everybody in my community was struggling to eat. So me as a kid, I always wanted steak and lobster and things oh, wow, like that. Oh, you're high end. Well, I, well, I wanted yeah. those things because I never had access to them. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It made me, made me crave for them. So yeah. as I got older, I realized that it takes a little bit of ingenuity to mm. cook some things that's not high end. So I realized that I needed to learn that. Check out when I wreck up. I love this horseshoe bar. It's about being my favorite kitchen all the time. Chef, what dish are you doing right now? What are you doing? Ah, uh, so this is Beautiful. a heritage pheasant. Mm -hmm. We dry aged it here, pound it out. Cool. After we'll fill it with some jollof rice. Mm. And this jollof is made from caramelized tomato paste, a cayenne pepper paste from last year's harvest, and nice. then fresh roasted uh, peppers in there as well. Oh, smelly it. You got it down. That's good. And what made you think about this dish? Because jollof, you kind of have to know someone in the West African community, right? right? Well, for me as a kid, I spent a little time inside of, a, inside of an orphanage. I was adopted by some uh, Nigerians oh, who cool. were originally from uh, Igbo. I'm I adopted too. Oh, That's yeah? Good. Yeah, I yeah. Spent, I spent a little bit of time living and working with them, and it allowed me to kind of connect the diaspora between African Americans and Western Africans. Yes, and they're uh, similar. Yep, so similar. Jambalaya and yeah. jollof are very much the same, right? Yeah, and it didn't start with jambalaya. It no, started it with jollof not. first. Yep, it started off with jollof. Right, right. I'll get your twine ready, chef. I had to make sure I had your back on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this dish that we're working on, this dish is titled Descendants of Igbo. Okay. Right, as I told you earlier, yeah. I spent some time with an Igbo and family as a child. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I noticed that they ate a lot was the yam, yeah. which is something that you see in soul food a lot, is candy yams, which is, I think is a dish that was reminiscent of African slaves missing home. Mm -hmm. Right? You have the yam, which is very much different from the sweet potato that you find mm -hmm. here in America. Yeah. So you begin to see African slaves make candy yams in an effort to make that sweet potato taste more like a yam. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. we preserved these candy yams back in 2015 and then emulsified them uh, with their own sugar. And we serve it as a dessert. Here in the South, we got pecans. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So what we're filling it with is a smoked pecan butter. Mm -hmm. So it's made from pecans that literally fall in our backyard. Yeah. This is our crunchy granola. When you have soul food and you have candy yams, you gotta have the marshmallows. Yeah, we're gonna torch a little bit. Yep, nice dark color. Nice. Man, I thought you were playing Call of Duty for a second. You had, <laughs> you were getting it in right there. Yeah, yeah. You got the pheasant now.
where you want the uh, gravy, just pour it right over the top. Yeah, there we go. Get saucy with it. Yeah. I'm excited, man. Oh, it yeah, looks good. Too. Thank you. And I can smell the smokiness, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, that's my favorite part about the entire thing. This is delicious. We titled it just Cowboys and Indians because Western Africa was filled with farmers and agriculturalists. They were considered to be the original cowboys of America. Mm -hmm. And then you have rice, which is Carolina gold rice, which mm -hmm. is one of the original grains brought to America from Africa. Yep. John and Rhodes is so talented, but he also is a chef with a mission. You get some culture, you get some history, and it's the perfect example of telling incredible food stories. When I eat this dish, the links between the African American and the Nigerian and West African community all comes together. You know what I mean? Thank you. That's what we're shooting for. Well, this is amazing what you showed me. The kitchen, the discipline, being in the neighborhood. Uh, the food is amazing. And congrats on your journey, man. Thank you, Chef. That's awesome. Really, congrats. Well, there's many reasons why we lost track of the links between West African food and Southern food. But they're all connected to systemic racism take slavery as a starting point to that, where the laborer had no authorship of the food that they were cooking and serving their masters. So three, 400 years later, you come back to a situation where the reference points are gone. And food gives us these reference points that can actually start a new dialogue, build a new bridge, and help you understand it. Another touch point that connects the West African and the African American community in Houston is music. Wherever you go, you hear the very upbeat, iconic sound of Afrobeat. Afrobeat was created by Felani Kulakbo Kuti, who was a musician, a radical, an activist. Afrobeat also inspired Afrobeats. Now the one with the S, because now you have younger generations who produce songs that are meant to appeal to a more universal audience. So they bring in all this cosmopolitan experience, and you see a lot of that in Houston. So I'm all about three H's, right? Heritage, um, ex you know, giving awareness and exposure of African culture, happiness, and health is why I bring this class to you. Um, and I thought about how to fuse both my love for dance and food, which is why I connected with my good friend Crystal Obi, and that's why we brought together this Beats and Brunch event. So Peter and Crystal have really found this incredible space between tradition and modern. And they're living this fast urban life. Peter is a high school principal, and Crystal is a medical doctor. But on the weekend, they focus on bringing people together around food, music, and dance. I'm now about to make a big fool out of myself, but you know what? I'm gonna have fun doing it. First move is out, out. Five, six, seven, go. Peter's specific dance moves comes out of the streets of Lagos. Good job. Marcus, you are a pro. <laughs> Every club from Lagos to Houston got some version of this. Now I want to do a dance called, everybody say Shaku Shaku. Shaku Shaku. Shaku Shaku is a big dance right now in Nigeria, and it's like going international. Shaku Shaku and Zaku become a phenomenon through YouTube, really, and connecting people all over the world. expression for a modern young West African, whether they live in Houston or in Nigeria. Let's go yeah. eat. Thank you.
The Afrobeat dance session is really a workout, right? And then you go into this tasty brunch where it's really balanced between traditional West African flavors and modern African-American flavors. So I'm loving the food. Tell me about this suya Hennessy chicken because <laughs> Those are like some of the best things in life, right? Right, right. You know, as Nigeria, we all love suya chicken, suya, yeah. suya meat, suya beef, anything like mm -hmm. that. So I was like, what about interfusing this with Hennessy? A little Hennessy, a little butter, a little mm -hmm. cinnamon, a little right. more spices. Before you knew it, um, my husband tasted it. He was like, oh my god, this That's is a good. Great <laughs> and the coconut rice, so that is Nigerian. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a very authentic recipe. And of course, any kind of Nigerian fusion, you have to have some plantains. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Both of you, but especially if you talked about dual culture between Nigeria and being here in Houston. So how do you guys balance those two things? This Beats and Brunches is a way for us to not only, you know, celebrate who we are, but also reclaim. Yeah. And, yes. and like yes. own yes. being African and being yes. Nigerian in America. Exactly. Um, I agree. Because before it was, we were ashamed of it, yes. but now I'm proud of it. Wow. But I also want to share it with other Nigerian Americans who also, again, struggle with being who they are. I think that's what this is all about. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I started my food blog, Kego's Kitchen, because I wanted to put out there our recipes like, hey, be proud. This is where you're from. Learn your authentic recipes, your agusi soup, your jollof, yep. your stew, your food, claim everything. It. You got to claim it. And it's not until recently that the lunchbox become cool, right? Yes. But when you were growing up, now like now it's really cool, let's trade. But back then, the fufu and the okra stew was not being swapped with somebody else. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now it's cool to be African. Mm -hmm. It's cool to wear African clothes. There's this big Wakanda movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's wearing a jashiki now, but... Yeah. It's Where cool was Wakanda to... when I grew up in Sweden, by the way? I missed, I missed that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think that this event helps yeah. bring together the food, the dance, the people, the merriment. That's what being African and being Nigerian is all about. Well, congrats, man. It's <laughs> awesome. Thank really you. good. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. That's good. Thank you so all much. Right. Very few people outside the West African community are consuming the culture, are eating the food. But right now, there is also a movement towards trying to create these bridges, right, between the West African food and the food in Texas and Houston, right? Playing with ingredients, they're testing heat levels, they're presenting it maybe in a more modern way, and it's just fun to be part of and see this in sort of in its beginning phase. My name is Toby Smith, and I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. So I moved over here um, about four years ago. I want to use the ingredients that I have over here to make things that I grew up eating. There's a lot of communities in Houston, so we try to draw from these different food cultures and fuse them with a Nigerian cuisine. So we create experiences, dinners, events, parties, and small gatherings for people, and the crowd is very diverse. They want their culture to be shown to people in a different light. <laughs> Chef Toby is really passionate about trying to make Nigerian flavors more popular. So he's kind of introducing it through cuisine already familiar to Westerns. Well, what are we doing? So we're making a pepper soup dish. Oh, no, a... I love pepper soup. That's so cool. Yeah, it's a plate on the Vietnamese pho and uh -huh. Nigerian pepper soup with the noodles, Which with is the Which perfect thing used to because you have Nigerian in the Yes, yes. You know, bringing those two cultures together. This pepper soup through the eyes of pho. It's like, here's my Nigerian food through the lens of already accepted food styles. There's many similarities, I think, yes. with Southeast Asia. With Ghana and Nigeria, you share the peanuts, which is used a lot in, let's say, Thai food. Yes, right? yes, peanuts. Yeah. And then you have the fish sauces that you have in Vietnam and yes. in Thai food. We have the same fish sauces, dried fish, yes. in Nigeria, and in Ghana, Senegal, and Ghana. Ghana so you build a mommy flavor, yes. and also, of course, the love of heat, chilies. So that's the pepper soup spice blend. It gives it the color, yeah. and it also gives it that flavor. So we also have, we usually use some sort of vegetable in there. So we're using Thai basil, you know, that so floral, aroma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get yes. that back to that pho. To that pho. So it's going to be, you know, herby. It's nice. going to be rich. It's going to be refreshing. And you still have that feel of that spicy, you know, pepper yeah. soup in there. People know a lot about Southeast Asian cooking. Yeah. They do not know so much 
about African and West African food. Yes. A lot of people go to Vietnamese restaurants. Yes. Yeah. Everybody knows, where are you going to? I'm going to a Fort place. And yeah. you have restaurants actually named after Fort. It's a lot of them in Houston. But you don't have that as the main item when you go to like Nigerian restaurants. Mm. Well, food takes time to travel, right? Yes. The more we interact and share with Africa, the more yeah. people are going to know about things yes. like that. Yes. But I think when something tastes this good, yeah. the truth is going to come out. Yeah, this is good, man. Out. Thank you. We don't appreciate African food in the same way as Asian cuisine because we don't trade with Africa the same way that we trade with other parts of the world. We see food in the supermarket, but we never see it associated with Africa as a premium. All of those things change why you adore and crave and want something. And we don't have that relationship as a whole with Africa yet. All right, who's hungry? Uh, everybody. So let's, let's get them in here. Come on, guys. One soup, two soups. All right. Awesome. Oh, that goes. Awesome. And I love how you cook the meat too. Very well done. Very the flavors here are so deep. It's great. It's good. Oh wow. So this is the Vietnamese rice noodle, Nigerian pepper soup broth. And then we have that goat meat that's been cooked down for about four hours and it's really tender so that you can enjoy it and not have to visit your dentist. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, so it's you get delicious. to enjoy. This is good. Amazing. Like Flavors are great. Toby does his private dinners so he can test the food, right, and see the reaction of his diners. They all come to gather, not only for the food, but also to see each other and remind each other we are a community and give each other support. This is Sarah, my friend. Nice. Uh, we work out together, we shop together. We do all things fun together. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. And I've never had Nigerian food. This is delicious. It is. And that's Vanessa. And she, we accepted her into the Nigerian clique. Mm. But she's actually from Equatorial Guinea. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. So how would the food in Guinea be different than Nigeria, for example? We share a couple of things okay. similar to Nigerian, because it's still West Africa, but we get our fusion will be from Spain because we're mm. colonized by Spanish yeah. people. Okay. But what would be one dish that's specifically from? from one Europe? dish. And you guys do a peanut soup? Yeah, from yeah. Ghana. Oh, they do? Ghana, Ghana, I Ghana. thought that was ours. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean that you're in Ghana, Ghana? We'll give them the peanut soup and take the jollof rice. <laughs> Even that, the jollof, is from Senegal. Just from the world of people from yeah, Senegal. Marcus, can you yeah. give us one thing? Oh, no, of course. You have suya. Yes, OK, we'll take the suya. You have fantastic and pepper soup. No. We'll take that. Yes, OK, we'll take, we'll take that. We'll take that. No, but I, I think the food, it's a great window in to people's culture, right? Yeah. A city like Houston is so important because it introduces people to all the West African countries in one way, particularly like with the cow feet. The goat head. Yeah, the goat head, <laughs> right? A little bit harder for Western palate, but that's okay because we learn how to eat kimchi and we learn how to eat sushi. We learn how to eat from other cultures. So, you know, but this for me is my favorite dish. Yeah. Because it really it's light and represent both cultures really, really cool. It's like the best of Houston, mm -hmm. right? Good job, Chef. So toast to you from Lagos to Houston, right? Yes, cheers. 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 Good to see you, good to see you. Opie is working really, really hard to push African food into the mainstream through his pop-up, which is really like a restaurant takeover for a night. So for Opie, his dream is really to create a West African fast casual restaurant that is inspired by African street food. This is our Kelly Willie. Kelly Willie Pelantin. Sounds okay. like a really good rapper. Kelly Willie, <laughs> Kelly Willie, right? So you see fried plantains, you see bean fritters, all food that you're really eating on the go. It's real good. Mm. That's just kind of what our whole thing is about, is about contemporary renditions of West African cuisine, mm -hmm. taking other cultural influences into play, and just trying to make it our own. What are the type of comments that you're getting from your food? Uh, we want more of it. <laughs> <laughs> more? Nice. This is flavor yes. that we've been
been waiting for. No, yeah, like, legit. I think it's twofold. You know, you get your crowd of people who they, they eat the food and it gives them a sense of nostalgia, right? Yeah. You also get your crowd of people who are coming out here to eat something that gives them a different experience. And so it's coming up with a cuisine that can definitely hit both of those oh. ends of the spectrum, but then putting together an overall experience to support. Kopi is magical at bringing people together. He knows enough chefs to execute the food. He knows enough people in front of the house to do that. And then he also has this tying into these great musicians, artists, there are football players, poets, foodies. So that's a perfect recipe for a great night. If you think about the measure of how good of a West African restaurant you are, is the jollof rice. Yeah, yeah. So our rendition of jollof is a jambalaya style jollof. And then we added some non-traditional vegetables. So we had some cauliflower and some Brussels sprouts in there, seasoned with yaji spice or suya spice. And then I think we're going to be bringing out some more food here shortly. How did you get started? How did you realize, OK, this is not a hobby anymore. I'm doing this. You know, I've lived in different parts of the world. And despite wherever I'm at, I always have to go out of my way to get the foods that I grew up on, right? It's always never in a location that happens to be convenient to the rest of the society. Yeah. I also noticed that within a lot of cultures, that was not the case. I could easily go and get some Italian food. I could yeah. easily go get some Chinese food or, or sure. whatnot. And one day I said, okay, that's it. Yeah. We're going to create the first contemporary West African inspired concept that allows the rest of the community into the beauty that we have as a culture in food. And Eric, you've been writing about the food scene for a long time here. How do you see the Houston food scene evolves? I think we're at the point now where each wave of different immigration, you know, once they get settled and, and a generation grows up here, they want to start telling their own stories. We saw that with Vietnamese immigrants and people from South Asia. And I, I really think West African is the next wave. You know, two years ago, I, I didn't know what jollof rice is. Yeah. And, and now I know where to go to find that and get my hands around what that cuisine is. Yeah. The more you know about West Africa, the likelier you are to eat the food, right? That's why I think it's so important that as Africans, we have to claim back and rewrite the story. And we're not just doing it from the food level, right? That is, business is important because that changes it. Sports and pop culture, you know, that opens up. You, you see it growing, you see it coming. And I feel like it's it's our duty to, to push the needle forward, yeah. to continue to bridge that gap, whether it be food, entertainment, music, athletics. I feel like it's our responsibility to, to really put us on the map, if you will. Congrats, guys. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. When I came to Houston, I did not know what to think. Leaving, I see the future. So in other aspects of West African culture, it's hit mainstream. There are West African basketball players in the NBA. There's tons of West African NFL players. So if you think about the moment of Afrobeat music, it's here right now. So food is this last level that we can break. This is really a moment, right? I call it the new noir, or where this generation of cooks here in Houston with West African heritage is the one that's going to break it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.